The Madman from Earth by Keith Lorma A Retief Story Originally published in Worlds of If, March 1962 Narrated by Tom Tresel 1. The Consul for the Terrestrial States, Retief said, presents his compliments, etc., to the Ministry of Culture of the Gorakian Autonomy, and with reference to the Ministry's invitation to attend a recital of interpretive grimacing, has the honour to express regret that he will be unable. You can't turn this invitation down, Administrative Assistant Mule said flatly. I'll make that accepts with pleasure. Retief exhaled a plume of cigar smoke. Miss Mule, he said, in the past couple of weeks I've sat through six light concerts, four attempts at chamber music, and God knows how many assorted folk art festivals. I've been tied up every off-duty hour since I got here. You can't offend the Gracchi, Miss Mule said sharply. Consul Waffle would never have been so rude. Waffle left here three months ago, Retief said, leaving me in charge. Well, Miss Mule said, snapping off the dick typer. I'm sure I don't know what excuse I can give the minister. Never mind the excuses, Retief said. Just tell him I won't be there. He stood up. Are you leaving the office? Miss Mule adjusted her glasses. I have some important letters here for your signature. I don't recall dictating any letters today, Miss Mule, Retief said, pulling on a light cape. I wrote them for you. They're just as Consul Waffle would have wanted them. Did you write all Waffle's letters for him, Miss Mule? Consul Waffle was an extremely busy man, Miss Mule said stiffly. He had complete confidence in me. Since I'm cutting out the culture from now on, Retief said, I won't be so busy. Well, Miss Mule said, may I ask where you'll be if something comes up? I'm going over to the Foreign Office Archives. Miss Mule blinked behind thick lenses. Whatever for? Retief looked thoughtfully at Miss Mule. You've been here on Groak for four years, Miss Mule. What was behind the coup d'etat that put the present government in power? I'm sure I haven't pried into. What about that terrestrial cruiser, the one that disappeared out this way about ten years back? Mr. Retief, those are just the sort of questions we avoid with the Groaki. I certainly hope you're not thinking of openly intruding. Why? The Groaki are very sensitive race. They don't welcome outworlders raking up things. They've been gracious enough to let us live down the fact that terrestrials subjected them to deep humiliation on one occasion. You mean when they came looking for the cruiser? I, for one, am ashamed of the high-handed tactics that were employed grilling these innocent people as though they were criminals. We try never to reopen that wound, Mr. Retief. They never found the cruiser, did they? Certainly not on Groak. Retief nodded. Thanks, Miss Mule, he said. I'll be back before you close the office. Miss Mule's face was set in lines of grim disapproval as he closed the door. The pale-featured Groakian vibrated his throat bladder in a distressed bleat. Not to enter the archives, he said in his faint voice. The denial of permission, the deep regret of the archivist. The importance of my task here, Retief said, enunciating the glottal dialect with difficulty. My interest in local history. The impossibility of access to outworlders, to depart quietly. The necessity that I enter. The specific instructions of the archivist, the Groakian's voice rose to a whisper, to insist no longer, to give up this idea. Okay, Skinny, I know when I'm licked, Retief said in Terran, to keep your nose clean. Outside, Retief stood for a moment looking across at the deeply carved windowless stucco facades lining the street, then started off in the direction of the terrestrial consulate general. The few Groakians on the street eyed him furtively, veered to avoid him as he passed. 
Flimsy, high-wheeled ground cars puffed silently along the resilient pavement. The air was clean and cool. At the office, Miss Mule would be waiting with another list of complaints. Retief studied the carving of the open doorways along the street. An elaborate one, picked out in pinkish paint, seemed to indicate the Groakian equivalent of a bar. Retief went in. A Groakian bartender was dispensing clay pots of alcoholic drink from the bar pit at the centre of the room. He looked at Retief and froze in mid-motion, a metal tube poised over a waiting pot. To enjoy a cooling drink, Retief said in Groakian, squatting down at the edge of the pit, to sample a true Groakian beverage. To not enjoy my poor offerings, the Groakian mumbled, a pain in the digestive sacs, to express regret. To not worry, Retief said, irritated, to pour it out and let me decide whether I like it. To be grappled in by peacekeepers for poisoning of foreigners, the barkeep looked around for support, found none. The Groaki customers, eyes elsewhere, were drifting away. To get the lead out, Retief said, placing a thick gold piece in the dish provided, to shake a tentacle. The procuring of a cage, a thin voice called from the sidelines, the displaying of a freak. Retief turned. A tall Groakian vibrated his mandibles in the gesture of contempt. From his bluish throat coloration, it was apparent the creature was drunk. To choke in your upper sack, the bartender hissed, extending his eyes toward the drunk. To keep silent, litter mate of drones. To swallow your own poison, dispenser of vileness, the drunk whispered. To find a proper cage for this zoo piece, he wavered toward Retief. To show this one in the streets, like all freaks. Seen a lot of freaks like me, have you? Retief asked interestedly. To speak intelligibly, malodorous outworlder, the drunk said. The barkeep whispered something, and two customers came up to the drunk, took his arms, and helped him to the door. To get a cage, the drunk shrilled. To keep the animals in their own stinking place. I've changed my mind, Retief said to the bartender. To be grateful as hell, but to have to hurry off now. He followed the drunk out the door. The other Groaki released him, hurried back inside. Retief looked at the weaving alien. To be gone, freak, the Groakian whispered. To be pals, Retief said. To be kind to dumb animals. To have you hauled away to a stockyard ill-odored foreign livestock. To not be angry, fragrant native, Retief said. To permit me to chum with you. To flee before I take a cane to you. To have a drink together. To not endure such insolence. The Groakian advanced toward Retief. Retief backed away. To hold hands, Retief said. To be palsy walsy The Groakian reached for him, missed. A passerby stepped around him, head down, scuttled away. Retief backed into the opening to a narrow crossway and offered further verbal familiarities to the drunken local, who followed, furious. Retief backed, rounded a corner into a narrow alley-like passage, deserted, silent, except for the following Groakian. Retief stepped around him, seized his collar, and yanked. The Groakian fell on his back. Retief stood over him. The downed native half rose, Retief put a foot against his chest and pushed. To not be going anywhere for a few minutes, Retief said. To stay right here and have a nice long talk. Two. There you are, Miss Mule said, eyeing Retief over her lenses. There are two gentlemen waiting to see you, Groakian gentlemen. Government men, I imagine. Word travels fast. Retief pulled off his cape. This saves me the trouble of paying another call at the Foreign Ministry. What have you been doing? They seem very upset. I don't mind telling you. I'm sure you don't. Come along, 
and bring an official recorder to Groaki wearing heavy eye shields and elaborate crest ornaments indicative of rank rose as Retief entered the room. Neither offered a courteous snap of the mandibles, Retief noted. They were mad, all right. I am fifth of the Terrestrial Desk, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Consul, the taller Grachian said in lisping Terran. May I present Schluch of the Internal Police? Sit down, gentlemen, Retief said. They resumed their seats. Miss Mule hovered nervously, then sat on the edge of a comfortless chair. Oh, it's such a pleasure, she began. Never mind that, Retief said. These gentlemen didn't come here to sip tea today. So true, Fifth said. Frankly, I have had a most disturbing report, Mr. Consul. I shall ask Schluch to recount it, he nodded to the police chief. One hour ago, the Groakian said, a Groakian national was brought to hospital suffering from serious contusions. Questioning of this individual revealed that he had been set upon and beaten by a foreigner, a terrestrial, to be precise. Investigation by my department indicates that the description of the culprit closely matches that of the terrestrial consul. Miss Mule gasped audibly. Have you ever heard, Retief said, looking steadily at Fifth, of a terrestrial cruiser, the ISV Terrific, which dropped from sight in this sector nine years ago? Really? Miss Mule exclaimed, rising. I wash my hands. Just keep that recorder going, Retief snapped. I'll not be a party. You'll do as you're told, Miss Mule, Retief said quietly. I'm telling you to make an official sealed record of this conversation. Miss Mule sat down. Fifth puffed out his throat indignantly. You reopen an old wound, Mr. Consul. It reminds us of certain illegal treatment at terrestrial hands. Hogwash, Retief said. That tune went over with my predecessors, but it hits a sour note with me. All our efforts, Miss Mule said, to live down that terrible episode, and you? Terrible? I understand that a terrestrial task force stood off Groak and sent a delegation down to ask questions. They got some funny answers and stayed on to dig around a little. After a week, they left. Somewhat annoying to the Groaki, maybe, at the most, if they were innocent. If! Miss Mule burst out. If, indeed, Fifth said, his weak voice trembling. I must protest your— Save the protests, Fifth. You have some explaining to do, and I don't think your story will be good enough. It is for you to explain— this person was beaten, not beaten, just wrapped a few times to loosen his memory. Then you admit, it worked too. He remembered lots of things once he put his mind to it. Fifth rose, Schluch followed suit. I shall ask for your immediate recall, Mr. Consul. Were it not for your diplomatic immunity, I should do more. Why did the government fall, Fifth? It was just after the task force paid its visit, and before the arrival of the first terrestrial diplomatic mission. This is an internal matter, Fifth cried in his faint Karakian voice. The new regime has shown itself most amiable to you terrestrials. It has outdone itself. To keep the terrestrial consul and his staff in the dark, Retief said, and the same goes for the few terrestrial businessmen you've visaed. This continual round of culture... No social contacts outside the diplomatic circle. No travel permits to visit outlying districts or your satellite. Enough! Fifth's mandibles quivered in distress. I can talk no more of this matter. You'll talk to me, or there'll be a task force here in five days to do the talking, Retief said. You can't! Miss Mule gasped. Retief turned a steady look on Miss Mule. She closed her mouth. The Groaki sat down. Answer me this one, Retief said, looking at Schluch. A few years back, about nine, I think, there was a little parade held here. Some curious-looking creatures were captured. After being securely caged, they were exhibited to the gentle Groaki public, hauled through the streets. Very educational, no doubt, a highly cultural show. 
Funny thing about these animals, they wore clothes. They seemed to communicate with each other. Altogether, it was a very amusing exhibit. Tell me, Shlo, what happened to those six terrestrials after the parade was over? Fifth made a choked noise and spoke rapidly to Shlo in Groachian. Shlo retracted his eyes, shrank down in his chair. Miss Mule opened her mouth, closed it, and blinked rapidly. How did they die? Retief snapped. Did you murder them, cut their throats, shoot them, or bury them alive? What amusing end did you figure out for them? Research, maybe? Cut them open to see what made them yell? No, Fifth gasped. I must correct this terrible false impression at once. False impression, hell, Retief said. They were Terrans. A simple narco interrogation would get that out of any Groachian who saw the parade. Yes, Fifth said weakly, it is true, they were terrestrials, but there was no killing. They're alive? Alas, no, they died, Miss Mule yelped faintly. I see, Retief said, they died. We tried to keep them alive, of course, but we did not know what foods. Didn't take the trouble to find out either, did you? They fell ill, Fifth said, one by one. We'll deal with that question later, Retief said. Right now, I want more information. Where did you get them? Where did you hide the ship? What happened to the rest of the crew? Did they fall ill before the big parade? There were no more. Absolutely, I assure you. Killed in the crash landing? No crash landing. The ship descended intact east of the city. The terrestrials were unharmed. Naturally, we feared them. They were strange to us. We had never before seen such beings. Stepped off the ship with guns blazing, did they? Guns? No, no guns. They raised their hands, didn't they? Asked for help. You helped them. Helped them to death. How could we know? Fifth moaned. How could you know a flotilla would show up in a few months looking for them, you mean? That was a shock, wasn't it? I'll bet you had a brisk time of it hiding the ship and shutting everybody up. A close call, eh? We were afraid, Schluff said. We are a simple people. We feared the strange creatures from the alien craft. We did not kill them, but we felt it was as well they did not survive. Then, when the warships came, we realized our error, but we feared to speak. We purged our guilty leaders, concealed what had happened, and offered our friendship. We invited the opening of diplomatic relations. We made a blunder, it is true, a great blunder, but we have tried to make amends. Where is the ship? The ship? What do you do with it? It was too big to just walk off and forget. Where is it? The two Groachians exchanged looks. "'We wish to show our contrition,' Fifth said. "'We will show you the ship.' "'Miss Mule,' Retief said, "'if I don't come back in a reasonable length of time, "'transmit that recording to regional headquarters, sealed,' "'he stood, looked at the Groachi. "'Let's go,' he said. "'Retief stooped under the heavy timbers "'shoring the entry to the cavern. "'He peered into the gloom "'at the curving flank of the space-burned hull.' Any lights in here? he asked. A Groachian threw a switch. A weak bluish glow sprang up. Retief walked along the raised wooden catwalk, studying the ship. Empty emplacements gaped below lensless scanner eyes. Littered decking was visible within the half-open entry port. Near the bow were the world's IVS terrific B-7 New Terror, were lettered in bright chrome duraloy. How did you get it in here? Retief asked. It was hauled here from the landing point some nine miles distant, Fifth said, his voice thinner than ever. This is a natural crevasse. The vessel was lowered into it and roofed over. How did you shield it so the detectors didn't pick it up? All here is high-grade iron ore, Fifth said, waving a member. Great veins of almost pure metal, Retief grunted. Let's go inside. 
Schloch came forward with a hand lamp. The party entered the ship. Retief clambered up a narrow companionway, glanced around the interior of the control compartment. Dust was thick on the deck. The stanchions where acceleration couches had been mounted, the empty instrument panels, the litter of shared bolts, scraps of wire and paper. A thin frosting of rust dulled the exposed metal where cutting torches had sliced away heavy shielding. There was a faint odour of stale bedding. The cargo compartment, Schlach began. I've seen enough, Retief said. Silently, the Groakians led the way back out through the tunnel and into the late afternoon sunshine. As they climbed the slope to the steam car, Fifth came to Retief's side. Indeed, I hope that this will be the end of this unfortunate affair, he said. Now that all has been fully and honestly shown. You can skip all that, Retief said. You're nine years late. The crew was still alive when the task force called, I imagine. You killed them, or let them die, rather than take the chance of admitting what you'd done. We were at fault, Fifth said abjectly. Now we wish only friendship. The Terrific was a heavy cruiser, about 20,000 tons, Retief looked grimly at the slender Foreign Office official. Where is she, Fifth? I won't settle for a hundred-ton lifeboat. Fifth erected his eye-stalks so violently that one eye-shield fell off. I know nothing of... of... He stopped. His throat vibrated rapidly as he struggled for calm. My government can entertain no further accusations, Mr. Consul, he said at last. I have been completely candid with you. I have overlooked your probing into matters not properly within your sphere of responsibility. My patience is at an end. Where is that ship? Retief rapped out. You never learn, do you? You're still convinced you can hide the whole thing and forget it. I'm telling you, you can't. We return to the city now, Fifth said. I can do no more. You can and you will, Fifth, Retief said. I intend to get to the truth of this matter. Fifth spoke to Schlach in rapid Gorakian. The police chief gestured to his four armed constables. They moved to ring Retief in. Retief eyed Fifth. Don't try it, he said. You'll just get yourself in deeper. Fifth clacked his mandibles angrily. Eye stalks canted aggressively toward the terrestrial. Out of deference to your diplomatic status, terrestrial, I shall ignore your insulting remarks, Fifth said in his reedy voice. Let us now return to the city. Retief looked at the four policemen. I see your point, he said. Fifth followed him into the car, sat rigidly at the far end of the seat. I advise you to remain very close to your consulate, Fifth said. I advise you to dismiss these fancies from your mind and to enjoy the cultural aspects of life at Groak. Especially, I should not venture out of this city or appear overly curious about matters of concern only to the Groakian government. In the front seat, Schla looked straight ahead. The loosely sprung vehicle bobbed and swayed along the narrow highway. Retief listened to the rhythmic puffing of the motor and said nothing. 3. Miss Mule, Retief said, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. I have to move rapidly now to catch the Groaki off guard. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, Miss Mule snapped, her eyes sharp behind the heavy lenses. If you'll listen, you may find out, Retief said. I have no time to waste, Miss Mule. They won't be expecting an immediate move, I hope, and that may give me the latitude I need. You're still determined to make an issue of that incident, Miss Mule snorted. I really can hardly blame the Gorachi. They are not a sophisticated race. They had never before met aliens. You're ready to forgive a great deal, Miss Mule, but it's not what happened nine years ago I'm concerned with. It's what's happening now. I've told you that it was only a lifeboat the Groaki have hidden out. Don't you understand the implication? That vessel couldn't have come far. The cruiser itself must be somewhere nearby. I want to know where. The Groaki don't know. They're a very cultured, gentle people. 
You can do irreparable harm to the reputation of terrestrials if you insist. That's my decision, Retief said. I have a job to do, and we're wasting time. He crossed the room to his desk, opened a drawer, and took out a slim-barrelled needler. This office is being watched. Not very efficiently, if I know the Groaki. I think I can get past them all right. Where are you going with that? Miss Mule stared at the needler. What in the world? The Groaki won't waste any time destroying every piece of paper in the files relating to this thing. I have to get what I need before it's too late. If I wait for an official inquiry commission, they'll find nothing but blank smiles. You're out of your mind! Miss Mule stood up, quivering with indignation. You like a... a... You and I are in a tight spot, Miss Mule. The logical next move for the Groaki is to dispose of both of us. We're the only ones who know what happened. Fifth almost did the job this afternoon, but I bluffed him out for the moment. Miss Mule emitted a shrill laugh. Your fantasies are getting the better of you, she gasped. In danger, indeed, disposing of me. I've never heard anything so ridiculous. Stay in this office. Close and safe lock the door. You've got food and water in the dispenser. I suggest you stock up before they shut the supply down. Don't let anyone in, on any pretext whatever. I'll keep in touch with you via handphone. What are you planning to do? If I don't make it back here, transmit the sealed record of this afternoon's conversation, along with the information I've given you. Beam it through on a Mayday priority. Then tell the Groaki what you've done, and sit tight. I think you'll be all right. It won't be easy to blast in here, and anyway, they won't make things worse by killing you. A force can be here in a week. I'll do nothing of the sort. The Groaki are very fond of me. You, Johnny, come lately. Roughneck, setting out to destroy. Blame it on me if it'll make you feel any better, Retief said. But don't be fool enough to trust them. He pulled on a cape, opened the door. I'll be back in a couple of hours, he said. Miss Mule stared after him silently as he closed the door. It was an hour before dawn when Retief keyed the combination to the safe lock and stepped into the darkened consular office. He looked tired. Miss Mule, dozing in a chair, awoke with a start. She looked at Retief, rose and snapped on the light, turned to stare. What in the world? Where have you been? What's happened to your clothing? I got a little dirty. Don't worry about it. Retief went to his desk, opened a drawer, and replaced the needler. Where have you been? Miss Mule demanded. I stayed here. I'm glad you did, Retief said. I hope you piled up a supply of food and water from the dispenser, too. We'll be holed up here for a week, at least. He jotted figures on a pad. Warm up the official sender. I have a long transmission for regional headquarters. Are you going to tell me where you've been? I have a message to get off first, Miss Mule, Retief said sharply. I've been to the Foreign Ministry, he added. I'll tell you all about it later. At this hour? There's no one there. Exactly. Miss Mule gasped. You mean you broke in? You burgled the Foreign Office? That's right, Retief said calmly. Now, this is absolutely the end, Miss Mule said. Thank heaven I've already— Get that sender going, woman, Retief snapped. This is important. I've already done so, Mr. Retief, Miss Mule said harshly. I've been waiting for you to come back here. She turned to the communicator, flipped levers. The screen snapped aglow, and a wavering long-distance image appeared. He's here now, Miss Mule said to the screen. She looked at Retief triumphantly. That's good, Retief said. I don't think the Groaki can knock us off the air, but— I've done my duty, Mr. Retief, Miss Mule said. I made a full report to regional headquarters last night, as soon as you left this office. Any doubts I may have had as to the rightness of that decision have been completely dispelled by what you just told me. Retief looked at her levelly. You've been a busy girl, Miss Mule. Did you mention the six terrestrials who were killed here? That had no bearing on the matter of your wild behaviour. I must say, in all my years in the Corps, I've never encountered a personality less suited to diplomatic work. The screen crackled, the ten-second transmission lag having elapsed. Mr. Retief, the face on the screen said, 
I am Councillor Pardee, DSO-1, Deputy Under Secretary for the Region. I have received a report on your conduct which makes it mandatory for me to relieve you administratively. Vice Mr. Yolanda Mule, DAO-9, pending the findings of a Board of Inquiry, you will... Retief reached out and snapped off the communicator. The triumphant look faded from Miss Mule's face. Why, what is the meaning? If I had listened any longer, I might have heard something I couldn't ignore. I can't afford that at this moment. Listen, Miss Mule, Retief went on earnestly, I found the missing cruiser. You heard him relieve you. I heard him say he was going to, Miss Mule, but until I've heard and acknowledged a verbal order, it has no force. If I'm wrong, he'll get my resignation. If I'm right, that suspension would be embarrassing all around. You're defying lawful authority. I'm in charge here now, Miss Mule stepped to the local communicator. I'm going to report this terrible thing to the Garaki at once, and offer my profound— Don't touch that screen, Retief said. You go sit in that corner where I can keep an eye on you. I'm going to make a sealed tape for transmission to headquarters, along with a call for an armed task force. Then we'll settle down to wait. Retief ignored Miss Mule's fury as he spoke into the recorder. The local communicator chimed. Miss Mule jumped up, staring at it. "'Go ahead,' Retief said. "'Answer it.' A Groakian official appeared on the screen. "'Yolanda Mule,' he said without preamble, "'for the Foreign Minister of the Groakian Autonomy, "'I herewith accredit you as Terrestrial Consul to Groak, "'in accordance with the advices transmitted to my government "'direct from the Terrestrial Headquarters. "'As Consul, you are requested to make available for questioning "'Mr. J. Retief, former consul, in connection with the assault on two peacekeepers and illegal entry into the offices of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Why, why, Miss Mule stammered, yes, of course, and I do want to express my deepest regrets. Retief rose, went to the communicator, assisted Miss Mule aside. Listen carefully, Fifth, he said. Your bluff has been called. You don't come in and we don't come out. Your camouflage worked for nine years, but it's all over now. I suggest you keep your heads and resist the temptation to make matters worse than they are. Miss Mule, Fifth said, a peace squad waits outside your consulate. It is clear you are in the hands of a dangerous lunatic. As always, the Graki wish only friendship with the terrestrials, but— Don't bother, Retief said. You know what was in those files I looked over this morning. Retief turned at a sound behind him. Miss Mule was at the door, reaching for the safe-lock release. Don't! Retief jumped. Too late. The door burst inward. A crowd of crested Graki pressed into the room, pushed Miss Mule back, aimed scatterguns at Retief. Police Chief Slur pushed forward. Attempt no violence, terrestrial, he said. I cannot promise to restrain my men. "'You're violating terrestrial territory, Schlach,' Retief said steadily. "'I suggest you move back out the same way you came in.' "'I invited them here,' Miss Mule spoke up. "'They are here at my express wish.' "'Are they? Are you sure you meant to go this far, Miss Mule? "'A squad of armed Graki and the consulate?' "'You are the consul, Miss Rwanda Mule,' Schlach said. "'Would it not be best if we removed this deranged person to a place of safety?' "'You're making a serious mistake, Schlach,' Retief said. "'Yes,' Miss Mule said. "'You're quite right, Mr. Schlach. "'Please escort Mr. Retief to his quarters in this building.' "'I don't advise you to violate my diplomatic immunity, Fifth, Retief said. "'As Chief of Mission,' Miss Mule said quickly, "'I hereby waive immunity in the case of Mr. Retief.' "'Schlach produced a hand recorder. "'Kindly repeat your statement, madam, officially,' he said. I wish no question to arise later. Don't be a fool, woman, Retief said. Don't you see what you're setting yourself in for? This would be a hell of a good time for you to figure out whose side you're on. I'm on the side of common decency. You've been taken in. These people are concealing. You think all women are fools, don't you, Mr. Retief? She turned to the police chief and spoke into the microphone he held up. That's an illegal waiver, Retief said. I'm consul here, whatever rumours you've heard. This thing's coming out into the open, whatever you do. Don't add violation of the consulate to the list of Groakian atrocities. Take the man, Schloss said. 
two tall Gorwaki came to Retief's side, guns aimed at his chest. "'Determined to hang yourselves, aren't you?' Retief said. "'I hope you have sense enough not to lay a hand on this poor fool here.' He jerked a thumb at Miss Mule. "'She doesn't know anything. I hadn't had time to tell her yet. She thinks you're a band of angels.' The cop at Retief's side swung the butt of his scattergun, connected solidly with Retief's jaw. Retief staggered against a Garachian, was caught and thrust upright, blood running down onto his shirt. Miss Mule yelped. Schler barked at the garden shrill Garachian, then turned to stare at Miss Mule. "'What has this man told you?' "'I—' "'Nothing. I refuse to listen to his ravings.' "'He said nothing to you of some—' "'Alleged involvement?' "'I've told you,' Miss Mule said sharply. She looked at the blood on Retief's shirt. "'He told me nothing,' she whispered. "'I swear it!' "'Let it lie, boys,' Retief said, "'before you spoil that good impression.' Schla looked at Miss Mule for a long moment. Then he turned. "'Let us go,' he said. He turned back to Miss Mule. "'Do not leave this building until further advice,' he said. "'But I am the terrestrial consul.' "'For your safety, madam. "'The people are aroused at the beating of Groachian nationals by an alien.' "'So long, Mulesy,' Retief said. "'You've played it real, Foxy.' "'You'll lock him in his quarters?' Miss Mule said. "'What is done with him is now a Groachian affair, Miss Mule.' You yourself had withdrawn the protection of your government. I didn't mean— Don't start having second thoughts, Retief said. They can make you miserable. I had no choice, Miss Mule said. I had to consider the best interest of the service. My mistake, I guess, Retief said. I was thinking of the best interest of a terrestrial cruiser with three hundred men aboard. Enough, Schler said. Remove this criminal— he gestured to the peacekeepers. "'Move along,' he said to Retief. He turned to Miss Mule. "'A pleasure to deal with you, madam.'" 4. Retief stood quietly in the lift, stepped out at the ground floor, and followed the sailor down the corridor and across the pavement to a waiting steam car. One of the peacekeepers rounded the vehicle to enter on the other side, two stooped to climb onto the front seat. Schloch gestured Retief into the back seat and got in behind him. The others moved off on foot. The car started up and pulled away. The cop in the front seat turned to look at Retief. "'To have some sport with it, and then to kill it,' he said. "'To have a fair trial first, Schloch said. The car rocked and jounced, rounded a corner, puffed along between ornamented pastel facades. "'To have a trial, and then to have a bit of sport,' the cop said. "'To suck the eggs in your own hill,' Retief said, "'to make another stupid mistake.' Schla raised his short ceremonial club and cracked Retief across the temple. Retief shook his head, tensed. The cop in the front seat beside the driver turned and rammed the barrel of his scattergun against Retief's ribs. "'To make no move, Outwilder,' he said. Schla raised his club and carefully struck Retief again. He slumped. The car swayed, rounded another corner. Retief slid over against the police chief. To fend this animal, Schla began. His weak voice was cut off short as Retief's hand shot out, took him by the throat, and snapped him down onto the floor. As the guard on Retief's left lunged, Retief uppercut him, slamming his head against the doorpost. He grabbed the scattergun as it fell, pushed into the mandibles of the Gorakin in the front seat. "'To put your popgun over the seat, carefully, and drop it,' he said. The driver slammed on his brakes, whirled to raise his gun. Retief cracked the gun barrel against the head of the Gorakin before him, then swivelled to aim it at the driver. "'To keep your eye stalks on the road,' he said. The driver grabbed at the tiller and shrank against the window, watching Retief with one eye, driving with the other. "'To gun this thing,' Retief said, "'to keep moving.' Schla stirred on the floor. Retief put a foot on him, pressed him back. The cop beside Retief moved. 
Retief pushed him off the seat onto the floor. He held the scattergun with one hand and mopped at the blood on his face with the other. The car bounded over the irregular surface of the road, puffing furiously. "'Your death will not be an easy one, Terrestrial,' Schlaas said in Terran. "'No easier than I can help,' Retief said. "'Shut up for now. I want to think.' The car, past the last of the relief-crusted mounds, sped along between tilled fields. "'Slow down,' Retief said. The driver obeyed. "'Turn down this side road.' The car bumped off onto an unpaved surface, threaded its way back among tall stalks. "'Stop here.' The car stopped. It blew off steam and sat trembling as the hot engine idled roughly. Retief opened the door, took his foot off Schlach. "'Sit up,' he ordered. "'You two in front, listen carefully.' Schlach sat up, rubbing his throat. Three of you are getting out here,' Retief said. "'Good old Schlach is going to stick around to dry for me. "'If I get that nervous feeling that the cops are after me, "'I'll toss him out to confuse them. "'That will be pretty messy at high speed. "'Schlach, tell them to sit tight until dark "'and forget about sounding any alarms.' I'd hate to see your carapace split and spill lovable you all over the pavement. To burst your throat, sack, evil-smelling beast, Schlach hissed. Sorry, I haven't got one, Retief put the gun under Schlach's ear. Tell them, Schlach, I can drive myself in a pinch. To do as the foreign one says, to stay hidden until dark, Schlach said. Everybody out, Retief said, and take this with you. He nudged the unconscious Garakian. Schlach, you get in the driver's seat. You others stay where I can see you. Retief watched as the Garaki silently followed instructions. All right, Schlach, Retief said softly. Let's go. Take me to Groak spaceport by the shortest route that doesn't go through the city, and be very careful about making any sudden movements. Forty minutes later, Schlach steered the car up to the sentry-guarded gate in the security fence surrounding the military enclosure at Groak spaceport. "'Don't yield to any rash impulses,' Retief whispered as a crested Garakian soldier came up. Schlach grated his mandibles in helpless fury. "'Drone Master Schlach, internal security,' he croaked. The guard tilted his eyes toward Retief. "'The guest of the autonomy,' Schlach added. To let me pass or to rot in this spot, fool? To pass, drone master, the sentry mumbled. He was still staring at Retief as the car moved jerkily away. You are as good as pegged out on the hill and the pleasure pits now, terrestrial, Schlach said in Terran. Why do you venture here? Pull over there in the shadow of the tower and stop, Retief said. Schlach complied. Retief studied the row of four slender ships parked on the ramp, navigation lights picked out against the early dawn colours of the sky. "'Which of those boats are ready to lift?' Retief demanded. Schla swivelled a choleric eye. "'All of them are shuttles. They have no range. They will not help you.' "'To answer the question, Schla, or to get another crack on the head?' "'You are not like other terrestrials. You are a mad dog.' We'll rough out a character sketch of me later. Are they all fueled up? You know the procedures here. Did those shuttles just get in, or is that the ready line? Yes, all are fueled and ready for take-off. I hope you're right, Schlach. You and I are going to drive over and get in one. If it doesn't lift, I'll kill you and try the next. Let's go. You are mad. I have told you. These boats have not more than ten thousand tons seconds capacity. They are useful only for satellite runs. Never mind the details. Let's try the first in line. Schla let in the clutch, and the steam car clanked and heaved, rolled off toward the line of boats. Not the first in line, Schla said suddenly. The last is the more likely to be fueled, but— Smart grasshopper, Retief said. Pull up to the entry port. Hop out and go right up. I'll be right behind you. The gangway guard. The challenging of... More details. Just give him a dirty look and say what's necessary. You know the technique. The car passed under the stern of the first boat, then the second. There was no alarm. 
It rounded the third, and shuddered to a stop by the open port of the last vessel. Out, Retief said, to make it snappy. Schla stepped from the car, hesitated as the guard came to attention, then hissed at him and mounted the steps. The guard looked wonderingly at Retief, mandibles slack. An outwilder, he said. He unlimbered his scattergun. To stop here, meat-faced one. Schla froze, turned. To snap to attention, litter mate of drones, Retief rasped in Groakian. The guard jumped, waved his eye stalks, and came to attention. About face, Retief hissed, hell out of here, to march. The guard tramped off across the ramp. Retief took the steps two at a time, slammed the port shut behind himself. I'm glad your boys have a little discipline, Schlach, Retief said. What did you say to him? I but... Never mind, we're in. Get up to the control compartment. What do you know of Grachian naval vessels? Plenty. This is a straight copy from the lifeboat you lads hijacked. I can run it. Get going. Retief followed Schlach up the companionway into the cramped control room. Tie in, Schlach, Retief ordered. This is insane, Schlach said. We have only fuel enough for a one-way transit to the satellite. We cannot enter orbit, nor can we land again. To lift this boat is death, unless your destination is our moon. The moon is down, Schlach, Retief said, and so are we, but not for long. Tie in. Release me, Schlach gasped. I promise you immunity. If I have to tie you in myself, I might bend your head in the process. Schla crawled onto the couch, strapped in. Give it up, he said. I will see that you are reinstated, with honour. I will guarantee a safe conduct. Countdown, Retief said. He threw into the autopilot. It is death, Schla screeched. The gyros hummed, timers ticked, relays closed. Retief lay relaxed on the acceleration pad. Schlach breathed noisily, his mandibles clicking rapidly. "'That I had fled in time,' Schlach said in a hoarse whisper. "'This is not a good death.' "'No death is a good death,' Retief said. "'Not for a while yet.' The red light flashed on in the centre of the panel, and a roughly sound filled the universe. The ship trembled, lifted. Retief could hear Schlach's whimpering even through the roar of the drive. Perihelion, Schlaas said dully. To begin now, the long fall back. Not quite, Retief said. I figure eighty-five seconds to go. He scanned the instruments, frowning. We will not reach the surface, of course, Schlaas said in Terran. The pips on the screen are missiles. We have a rendezvous in space, Retief. In your madness, may you be content. The fifteen minutes behind us, Schlach, your defences are sluggish. Never more to burrow in the grey sands of Groak, Schlach said. Retief's eyes were fixed on a dial face. Any time now, he said softly. Schlach counted his eye stalks. What do you seek? Retief stiffened. Look at the screen, he said. Schlach looked. A glowing point, off centre, moving rapidly across the grid. What? Later! Schla watched as Retief's eyes darted from one needle to another. How? For your own neck's sake, Schla, Retief said, you'd better hope this works. He flipped the sending key. 2396TR-42G, this is the terrestrial consulate Groak aboard Groak 902, vectoring on you at an MP fix of 91-54-94. Can you read me? Over. What forlorn gesture is this? Schla whispered. You cry in the night to emptiness. Button your mandibles, Retief snapped, listening. There was a faint hum of stellar background noise. Retief repeated his call, waited. Maybe they hear but can't answer, he muttered. He flipped the key. 2396 You've got twenty seconds to lock a tractor beam on me, or I'll be past you like a shot of rum past a sailor's bridge work. To call into the void, Schlach said, to look at the DV screen. Schlach twisted his head, looked. Against the background mist of stars, a shape loomed, 
dark and inert. It is a ship, Schlaff said. A monster ship. That's her, Retief said. Nine years and a few months out of new terror on a routine mapping mission. The missing cruiser. The IVS Terrific. Impossible, Schlaff hissed. The hulk swings in a deep cometary orbit. Right, and now it's making its close swing past Groak. You think to match orbits with a derelict, without power? Our meeting will be a violent one, if that is your intent. We won't hit. We'll make our pass about about five thousand yards. To what end, terrestrial? You have found your lost ship. Then what? Is this glimpse worth the death we die? Maybe they're not dead, Retief said. Not dead? Schla lapsed into Grachian. To have died in the burrow of one's youth, to have burst my throat sack ere I embarked with the mad alien to call up the dead. Two three nine six, make it snappy, Retief called. The speaker crackled heedlessly. The dark image on the screen drifted past, dwindling now. Nine years, and the mad one speaking as to friends, Schla raved. Nine years dead, and still to seek them. Another twenty seconds, Retief said softly, and we're out of range. Look alive, boys. Was this your plan, Retief? Schla asked in Terran. Did you flee Groak and risk all on this slender thread? How long would I have lasted in one of your Groaki prisons? Long and long, my Retief, Schla hissed, under the blade of an artist. Abruptly the ship trembled, seemed to drag, rolling the two passengers in their couches. Schla hissed as the restraining harness cut into him. The shuttle boat was pivoting heavily, upending, crushing acceleration forces built. Schla gasped and cried out shrilly, What is it? It looks, Retief said, like we've had a little bit of luck. 5. On our second pass, the gaunt-faced officer said, they let fly with something. I don't know how it got past our screens. It socked home in the stern and put the main pipe off the air. I threw full power to the emergency shields and broadcast our identification on a scatter that should have hit every receiver within a parsec. Nothing. Then the transmitter blew. I was a fool to send the boat down, but I couldn't believe somehow. In a way, it's lucky you did, Captain. That was my only lead. They tried to finish us after that, but with full power to the screens, nothing they had could get through. Then they called on us to surrender. Retief nodded. I take it you weren't tempted. More than you know, it was a long swing out on our first circuit. Then, coming back in, we figured we'd hit. As a last resort, I would have pulled back power from the screens and tried to adjust the orbit with the steering jets, but the bombardment was pretty heavy. I don't think we'd have made it. Then we swung past and headed out again. We've got a three-year period. Don't think I didn't consider giving up. Why didn't you? The information we have is important. We've got plenty of stores aboard. Enough for another ten years, if necessary. Sooner or later, a new search command would find us. Retief cleared his throat. I'm glad you stuck with it, Captain. Even a backwater world like Groak can kill a lot of people when it runs amok. What I didn't know, the captain went on, was that we're not in a stable orbit. We're going to graze atmosphere pretty deeply this pass, and in another sixty days we'll be back to stay. I guess the Groaki would be ready for us. No wonder they were sitting on this so tight, Retief said. They were almost in the clear. And you're here now, the captain said. Nine years, and we weren't forgotten. I knew we could count on. It's over now, Captain, Retief said. That's what counts. Home, the Captain said, after nine years. I'd like to take a look at the films you mentioned, Retief said, the ones showing the installations on the satellite. The Captain complied. Retief watched as the scene unrolled showing the bleak surface of the tiny moon as the Terrific had seen it nine years before. In harsh black and white, 
Row on row of identical hulls cast long shadows across the pitted metallic surface of the satellite. Retief whistled. They had quite a little surprise in store. Your visit must have panicked them. They should be about ready to go by now. Nine years? Hold the picture, Retief said suddenly. What's that ragged black line across the plain there? I think it's a fissure. The crystalline structure... I've got what may be an idea, Retief said. I had a look at some classified files last night at the Foreign Office. One was a progress report on a fissionable stockpile. It didn't make much sense at the time. Now I get the picture. Which is the north end of that crevasse? At the top of the picture. Unless I'm badly mistaken, that's the bomb dump. The Groaki like to tuck things underground. I wonder what a direct hit with a 50 megaton missile would do to it. If that's an ordnance storage dump, the captain said, it's an experiment I'd like to try. Can you hit it? I've got 50 heavy missiles aboard. If I fire them in direct sequence, it should saturate the defences. Yes, I can hit it. The range isn't too great. These are the deluxe models, the captain smiled balefully video guidance. We could steer them into the bar and park them on a stool. What do you say we try it? I've been wanting a solid target for a long time, the captain said. Retief waved a hand toward the screen. That expanding dust cloud used to be the satellite of Groakschlach, he said. Looks like something happened to it. The police chief stared at the picture. Too bad, Retief said, but then it wasn't of any importance, was it, Schlach? Schlach muttered incomprehensibly. Just a bare hunk of iron, Schlach. That's what the foreign office told me when I asked for information. I wish you'd keep your prisoner out of sight, the captain said. I have a hard time keeping my hands off him. Schlach wants to help, Captain. He's been a bad boy, and I have a feeling he'd like to cooperate with us now, especially in view of the imminent arrival of a terrestrial ship and the dust cloud out there. What do you mean? Captain, you can ride it out for another week, contact the ship when it arrives, get a tow in and your troubles are over. When your films are shown in the proper quarter, a task force will come out here. They'll reduce Groak to a sub-technical cultural level and set up a monitor system to ensure she doesn't get any more expansionist ideas. Not that she can do much now with a handy iron mine in the sky gone. That's right, and... On the other hand, Retief said, there's what I might call the diplomatic approach. He explained at length. The captain looked at him thoughtfully. I'll go along, he said. What about this fellow? Retief turned to Schlach. The Groakian shuddered, eye stalks retracted. I will do it, he said faintly. Right, Retief said. Captain, if you'll have your men bring in the transmitter from the shuttle, I'll place a call to a fellow named Fifth at the Foreign Office. He turned to Schlach. And when I get him, Schlach, you'll do everything exactly as I've told you or have terrestrial monitors dictating in Groak City. Quite candidly, Retief, Councillor Pardy said, I'm rather nonplussed. Mr. Fifth of the Foreign Office seemed almost painfully lavish in your praise. He seemed most eager to please you. In the light of some of the evidence I've turned up of highly irregular behaviour on your part, it's difficult to understand. Fifth and I have been through a lot together, Retief said. We understand each other. You have no cause for complacency, Retief, Pardy said. Miss Mule was quite justified in reporting your case. Of course, had she known that you were assisting Mr. Fifth in his marvellous work, she would have modified her report somewhat, no doubt. You should have confided in her. Fifth wanted to keep it secret, in case it didn't work out, Retief said. You know how it is. Of course. And as soon as Miss Mule recovers from her nervous breakdown, there'll be a nice promotion awaiting her. 
The girl more than deserves it for her years of unswerving devotion to core policy. Unswerving, Retief said. I'll sure go along with that. As well you may, Retief. You've not acquitted yourself well in this assignment. I'm arranging for a transfer. You've alienated too many of the local people. But as you said, Fifth speaks highly of me. Oh, true, is the cultural intelligentsia I'm referring to. Miss Muir's records show that you deliberately affronted a number of influential groups by boycotting. Tone deaf, Retief said. To me, a Groakian blowing a nose whistle sounds like a Groakian blowing a nose whistle. You have to come to terms with local aesthetic values, Pardy explained. Learn to know the people as they really are. It's apparent from some of the remarks Miss Mule quoted in her report that you held the Groaki in rather low esteem. But how wrong you were! All the while, they were working unceasingly to rescue those brave lads marooned aboard their cruiser. They pressed on even after we ourselves had abandoned the search, and when they discovered that it had been a collision with their satellite which disabled the craft, they made that magnificent gesture. Unprecedented! One hundred thousand credits in gold to each crew member as a token of Groakian sympathy. A handsome gesture, Retief murmured. I hope, Retief, that you've learned from this incident. In view of the helpful part you've played in advising Mr. Fifth in matters of procedure to assist in his search, I'm not recommending a reduction in grade. We'll overlook the affair, give you a clean slate, but in future... I'll be watching you closely. You can't win em all, Retief said. You'd better pack up. You'd be coming along with us in the morning, Pardy shuffled his papers together. I'm sorry, he said, that I can't file a more flattering report on you. I would have liked to recommend your promotion along with Miss Mules. That's okay, Retief said. I have my memories. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past From the pages of dusty old pulp magazines to your ear